بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful سبحان الله الحمد لله ولا اله الا الله والله اكبر Our excellence presents ولا اله الا الله Lessons from the stories of the prophets by Mufti Ismail ibn Musa Mank. Adam alayhi salam on earth part 2. Adam peace be upon him on earth part 2. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد All praise is due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى Blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم We ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to bless him and all his companions To bless every single one of us To bless our offspring those to come up to the day of قيامة May Allah سبحانه وتعالى keep them all steadfast on this deen and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us as well steadfast on the deen. This evening as we were reading the salah, the taraweeh, so a thought came to my mind, and that is a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha. She says that she used to watch the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam read salah at night. So often, most of the night, almost all of the night. To the degree that his feet became swollen and she asked him a question she says oh messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah has kept you free from sin and Allah has forgiven you in fact anything to come and anything that was there is nothing you have such a high rank you are so high you know your rank so why is it that you are spending so much time in salah that your feet are actually swollen and he answered so beautifully and I think we should all be thinking of it because none of our feet are swollen right now yet we find it so difficult to stand for one hour sometimes may Allah make it easy for us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson from the answer of this most beloved creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says Afala akuna abdan shakura. Should I not be a slave who is grateful, who is thankful to his creator for the status that he was granted? Subhanallah. So with him, he had the status, he knew it, he had this link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he wanted to please Allah even more. So that's what made him happy. It made him happy when he could stand and his legs were swollen because of standing for his own creator. I want to ask a question and a serious question. What makes us happy? Let's be frank, let's be honest. If you struck a good deal and today business was brisk, we become happy. If we're feeling healthy and our sickness is gone, we become happy. If we've just purchased clothing that fits us nicely and it looks good, we become excited. This is what makes us happy. If for example, we've purchased a new vehicle and it's sitting there in the front, we're happy. MashaAllah. If for example, we've won a ticket to Hawaii or Honolulu for a holiday, we're excited, we're happy. Let's be honest. This is what makes us happy. If our salaries have increased and our hours have decreased, we become happy. Yes. Now let's take a look at the lesson that we have. From this blessed hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, yes, it is natural to be happy at what I've just mentioned, but that happiness is momentary. It is just for a moment. It is not supposed to be prolonged happiness. The true excitement must be when your legs start paining and you're standing and you say, "Ya Allah, this is for you." Allahu Akbar. Ya Allah, if it was not for you, I would not even have dressed appropriately. Allahu Akbar. So when you are dressed appropriately, covering properly, and people are laughing at you and calling you names, you need to say, Ya Allah, this is what makes me so happy. Because I know you're writing next to my name rewards that will grant me entry into Jannah. And Allah says, 
ان الذين اجرموا كانوا من الذين امنوا يضحكون the criminals used to laugh at the believers in this world the criminals used to laugh at the believers if you are dressed as a muslim woman one of the ways of telling that you are dressed properly is sometime in your life someone will pass a negative comment or someone will laugh at you or someone will say something discouraging then you know you've dressed properly subhanallah because that's allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan and i'm talking here of when you are living in a non-muslim country and sometimes even from amongst our own family members they discourage us no you're too young to cover your hair don't cover it now wait until you grow how are you going to get married they're not going to see what the head and shoulders look like in your hair Allahu Akbar. May Allah safeguard us. This is the mentality that people have. Yet we don't understand. When we cover it for the sake of Allah, it must make us happy. Imagine, on one hand, we got the example of the swollen legs. What is that example compared to just covering properly? Allahu Akbar. May Allah use us really in His cause. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us this evening to make a resolution that we will dress appropriately, come what may. And may Allah make us from those who can make a resolution this evening that come what may, we will fulfill our five salah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not worth leaving it out. I was thinking moments ago as I was getting up that for myself, it has rekindled the link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make mention of how everything began and the creation of Adam alayhi salam and the stories of the prophets. Not to say there was no link, but we rekindle the link and we want to keep that fire going we want to keep that light going i wonder if it is the same for all of us that we have this link we feel that really we are going to return to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this evening inshallah we will be completing the story of adam alayhi salatu wassalam with a few details inshallah and thereafter we will continue tomorrow with the stories of the other prophets of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to start with this Quran, we need to understand, as I had made mention of at the end of yesterday's talk, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we will send for you reminders. And whosoever turns away from the reminders, they will be resurrected blind. If you recall, we made, we made mention of it and we read the verse, which happens to be in Surah Taha. And thereafter, there is a point that needs to be highlighted. What did the kuffar of Quraysh used to say at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when the Quran was being revealed? They knew that anybody who listens to this Quran, they are automatically inclined towards it. One is to look at the face of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is already a turning point. You need a little bit of sincerity and you're turned. And after that, to listen to the words of the Quran, it melts you. Allahu Akbar. Today there were so many verses that were read. And I was thinking to myself, I wish I could pause to translate some of those verses. One of them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O man, if Allah wills, He can delete you and replace you with others. If Allah wants, He can wipe you out and bring others. In another place in the Quran, Allah says the same thing. That if you are not going to worship Allah, if you want to turn away from Allah's worship, He does not need you, O oh man. He can actually delete you. You know how powerful is that word, delete? Imagine if someone had to tell you, I'm going to delete you. And you look at them and say, what? You probably take your gun out for them in this country. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. And here Allah is saying, He's explaining how independent He is and how dependent we are. He says, if you, if you, if I so will, I can actually delete you and I can bring others. May Allah never do that to us. So that's a powerful verse. Another verse that we mentioned this evening, that sometimes in order to please people and to seek status, we please people in the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says, Do they want to seek that status with those people there in the displeasure of Allah, let them know. It is Allah alone who, owe, who owns the dignity and the status. If Allah wants, He can raise you. And if He wants, He can drop you. There is no point in pleasing people in the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, if the people are displeased while, whilst Allah is pleased, then Alhamdulillah, we are heading in the right direction. So the Quran, 
I'd like to make mention of a very interesting story at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The kuffar of Quraysh sent one of the most eloquent from amongst them, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in order to try and tell him that, you know, you better stop doing what you're doing. This was in the initial stages. And we don't want you to swear our idols. We want you, you know, to take what you want from us, but stop preaching all this that you are preaching about one God and one creator and supreme maker. Why did they decide this? Because they were materialistic people. For them, what made them happy when they had power? They were elected as chairman. They were elected as someone big. They became happy. That was the height of their life. And I normally say when someone has got to a peak and they tell me I've got to a peak, I say, does that mean you can die now? You've achieved what you wanted to from life. With us, no. The peak will only come when Allah decides. We, for us as Muslimin, we should be happy when we are obeying the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these kuffar, they decided, let's go and make him some offer. He'll accept one of the offers. So they made him a few offers. The one went to him and he says, and he was an eloquent man. And he says, oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, we want you to leave what you are saying. If you want, we can get you married to the most beautiful of women. If women is what you are looking for. Look at how they're thinking. If wealth is what you're looking for, we make you the wealthiest. If power is what you're looking for, you can be our king and our leader. What is it that you want? We will dish it out to you now, but stop saying what you're saying. And Muhammad وسلم, said the famous saying, Wallahi, if you are to put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left, and then you are to ask me to stop what I'm saying, I'll never stop it. What that means is give me what you want. Give me that which is impossible. This is a mission I have come with. Then he began to read verses of the Quran. Hamim tanzilum min ar-Rahman ar-Rahim kitab fussilat ayatuhu Qur'anan arabiyyan liqawmin ya'lamun bashiran wa nadhira That surah, he continued reading it until he got to a place where he made mention of the punishment of the previous nations. This was the verse. He got to this verse. He says, فَإِنْ أَعْرَضُوا فَقُلْ أَنْذَرْتُكُمْ صَاعِقَةً مِثْلَ صَاعِقَةِ عَادٍ وَثَمُودٍ If they are going to turn away, then warn them of the punishment that got to Ad and Thamud. At this stage, the man puts his hand on the mouth of the Prophet ﷺ and blocks it and says, stop, 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 stop. That's enough. Why? He did not want to hear the punishment. Then he ran back to his people and says, oh, my people. He went back to Abu Jahl and the others. And he says, you know what? I have heard something today. Recitation, I have heard. It is so sweet. It is so beautiful. It is so correct. It is so apt. It is something that you just feel like continuing listening to. And it has so much in it and so on. And it is definitely not the speech of man. They looked at him. They said, what? We sent you to tell that man to get out of what he's saying. And you come back telling us you're almost convinced. He says, no, 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 no. I'm only letting you know what I heard. I'm not convinced. Look at this. Look at what happened. Now what happens to us? We listen to the Quran. We read the Quran. We understand the message of Allah. Are we not sometimes being cheated the same way by shaitan? Where we say it's a beautiful Quran. I enjoy listening to this sheikh and that sheikh and this person and that reciter and mashallah this one and that one. But how much are we following it? What's the point of getting the, the, the enjoyment of the ear alone? That was achieved by the kuffar as well. I can tell you a true story. I had stopped one day at the traffic light with the Quran a little bit loud. I don't want to call it blasting, but mashallah it was loud. And there were people right next to me. They looked at me and they said, you know, they, they like sort of putting their thumbs up and I, I put it down to talk to them. They said, I love your music. What music is this? So it shows us that if, if we are going to stop at the soothing of the ears alone, then that happens to the kuffar as well. What's the difference? We are supposed to be taking it further and putting practice to what we listen to. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors and may he grant us a deep understanding. So this is why at that time they did not want to hear any revelation. Shaitan had a plan and that plan was he was going to turn people away from revelation. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَا تَسْمَعُوا لِهَذَا الْقُرْآنِ 
The disbelievers used to say, do not listen to this revelation. Don't listen to the Quran. Make noise whilst it is being read. Because as people were listening to it, it was piercing their ears. It was piercing their hearts. And it was going in. They were digesting it and they were turning. As they were turning, the kuffar did not know how to stop it. Didn't I say yesterday that man needs spirituality in order to complete himself and in order to be content. So as the people were turning, they did not know what to do. So these kuffar of Quraysh, the leaders started saying, don't listen to the Quran. This is why one of the biggest sins we can have is when Allah has sent down a book and we are stopping people from trying to understand that book. And we are stopping people from reading the book. And we are discouraging people from trying to understand the Quran. That is one of the biggest sins we could ever have. Because Allah promised Adam alayhi salam right at the beginning that I'm going to send you guidance. And every time guidance comes, whoever follows it will be rightly guided. And whoever doesn't, then it is them to blame. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. So from the beginning, there were two forces. Hizbullahi and Hizbu shaytani there is the force of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the force of the devil. These two forces are very clear in our lives. We see it from the very beginning. We are lucky. We are fortunate that we were told how it started and what the root of it was. It is so really so soothing to know the beginning because now we can do something about it. We do not have to reinvent the wheel. It's already there. We believe we've seen. We have these verses that are recited for us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of these two forces from the very beginning. And we need to understand. Not only that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mercy to all of us, He goes a step further. What is that step? He teaches us from the beginning how to protect ourselves from the devil. Ya bani Adama, la yaftinannakum ash-shaytanu kama akhraja abawaykum min al-jannah yanzi'u anhuma libasahuma liyuriyahuma sawatihima innahu yaraakum huwa wa qabiluhu min haythu la tarawnahum inna ja'alna ash-shayatina awliya'a lil-ladhina la yu'minun Powerful verses of the Quran. Allah says, O oh, children of Adam, we are all included in this. Do not let the shaitan lead you astray or do not let him overpower you or overcome you or cheat you or test you in the way that he did with your forefather Adam and his wife Hawa and he removed them as a result from the goodness that they were in. So Allah is warning us. Allah tells us be warned and over and above that we are taught that the last part of that verse Allah says shaitan will not be able to be a protector for those who believe he can only be a protector for those who disbelieve he can offer them this sort of false protection for a moment we ask Allah to make us the true believers and to make us from those whom Allah has protected now if you take a look at Shaitan and what he did and the fact that he had removed Adam and Hawa alayhim as -salam, from Jannah he removed them from Jannah by conning them this happens to us on a daily basis Allah says if you ask Allah's protection you will never ever be led astray so every morning and every evening it is our duty to ask the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we are taught Listen to the verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقُلْ رَبِّ أَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ هَمَزَاتِ الشَّيَاطِينَ وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ رَبِّ أَنْ يَحْضُرُونَ O Messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, say, invoke Allah, call Allah with the following words. Say, I seek Allah's protection from the whisperings of the devil. And I seek Allah's protection from these devils even coming into my presence. Isn't that a powerful dua? We will find it in Surah Al-Mu'minun towards the end. And this dua should be read by us on a daily basis. We are seeking the protection of Allah from the devil and his whisperings. And we are seeking the protection of Allah from the devil even coming into our presence because we don't want him to come into our presence. What a powerful dua. 
In a hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam speaks about the power of Ayatul Kursi. And I'm sure we all know it off by heart. But we have to read it every morning, every evening. Thrice in the morning, thrice in the evening. In another narration, the power of the last two surahs of the Quran is being made mention of. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ They are known as Al-Mu'awwidhatayn. Those two surahs wherein we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from so much evil. We need to read these surahs three times in the morning, three times in the evening. Now, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? A verse we read this evening. إِنَّ كَيْدَ الشَّيْطَانِ كَانَ ضَعِيفًا The plot of the devil is very weak. Shaitan's plot is very weak. And if we are to seek the protection of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, it won't even affect us. It won't even bother us. So it's important whilst we spoke about the devil, that we also speak about how to be protected from the devil. It literally creates a metal armor around you when you read this early morning and every evening for the rest of the day and the rest of the night. And shaitan will not be able to harm you and attack you. There is something known as the evil eye that is also from the devil. There is something known as jealousy that is also from the devil. There is something known as envy that is also from the devil. We will be protected from all this. We will also be protected from the magic that people want to engage in and the black magic and what have you. All this we will be protected from, including being protected from the jinn kind at large. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. For your information, jinn kind is very, very frightened of man. Very, very frightened of man. But when we show a weak link, then he gets excited. He gets excited. You know, it reminds me of a story. Maybe on a lighter note, we could mention this. They say there was a man who was very soft natured, very, very soft natured. And when he was getting married, the people were worried that your wife is going to control you completely. Your wife is going to control you completely. He says, so what should I do? They gave him an idea. They said, first night, get a stick and we'll release a cat into the room. And as soon as, you know, you walk into the room, when the cat appears, you must just put your headgear on one side and start beating the cat until you kill it. And then throw it out of the window like a man and that's the only thing you're going to need to do. He says, well, that's fine. On the other hand, his wife was hearing that, you know, you've got such a soft-natured husband, you're so lucky. So what happened first night, they released the cat and the plan worked. He beat up the cat and she was scared looking at him. This is not what I knew him as. And then the cat died and he threw it out of the window. And he says, no, I'm sorry about that. He cleansed everything and it was all back to normal. Every day he would say, I'd like you to do this or else. Or else what? Subhanallah. Or else. As soon as he says, or else, she's worried that or else I'll get that whack, you know, just like the cat. Until some time later, she went back to her family. She went back to her friends. But you people told me this man was soft. They said, no, try defying him once. See what happens. You see, we're talking here of the jinn and how weak the jinn is. So what happened is, he says, I want you to have the tea ready at 7 o'clock or else. She says, or oh, else what? Or oh, else I'll have it ready. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us protection and understanding. Really. So how we feel that shaitan and the devil is strong. Wallahi, he is weak. Defy him and see what happens. Defy the devil. I'm not saying the husbands are devils. But what we are saying, subhanallah, is that we need to learn a lesson. When we have a perception that something is stronger than us, we tend to be overcome by it. Why? Wallahi, it is weak. It is something that is frightened of us. Let us understand when we defy this devil and with the Quran and with the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will run away. Getting to the children of Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, how did they come about? It's a question. Hawa, may peace be upon her, she gave birth 20 times. Each time there was a boy and a girl, subhanallah. They were of different colors, different shapes and sizes in the sense that, you know, the looks were varying from one to the other and so on. And at that time, they had to be married. So how were they going to marry? They had a different law. They had a different sharia. Adam alayhi salam, how did he become a prophet? That is also a very important question for us to answer. Initially, he was the father. When he had his children, he began to remind his children of what happened in Jannah and what happened with the devil. So automatically he was a Nabi of Allah. He was, he was reminding them of the beginning and who Allah is 
and how we must worship Allah alone because he is the sole creator and how the devil cheated them and got them out of paradise so they all knew directly from Adam alayhi salam that this is what happened and Adam alayhi salam was giving them da'wah he was literally calling them towards goodness and keeping them on the right track so as the children grew one of the oldest children was known as Qabil in the English language Cain and the one younger than him was known as Habil or Abel in the English language we find some similarities in the previous revelations with what we also have in Islam so what was the difference between these two listen very carefully Cain was not so good looking and Abel was very handsome listen to this and the sister of Cain was very good looking but she was born in the same or from the same womb so those two were what we call womb brothers and sisters from the same womb and when it came to Abel he was very good looking but his sister was not as good looking look at how looks affected them from the very beginning so Adam alayhi salam instructed the two when the time came and they Allah put naturally in them the inclination towards marriage and partnership and so on so Adam alayhi salam says you will marry the sister of this one and this one will marry the sister of your meaning your sister so Cain his sister was very good looking he looked at this girl he's supposed to marry and he says she's not that good looking and why must I give my sister to this guy why imagine the question I don't want to give my sister if we read the books of the historians Ibn Kathir rahimahullah has made mention of what I'm saying he says Qabil or Cain says I don't want my sister to go to him and I don't want to have his sister I'd rather have my own sister he's saying Astaghfirullah. but anyway that was what went through his mind and as a result it created a problem look at how marriage up to today creates problems between people the hadith the Prophet ﷺ says إِذَا جَاءَكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُوقَهُ فَزَوِّجُوهُ إِلَّا تَفْعَلُوهُ تَكُنْ فِتْنَةٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَفَسَادٌ عَرِيدٌ if a proposal comes to you from a person whose level of deen you are happy with and whose character you are happy with then get them married if you don't get them married there will be great fitna and facade and corruption and lots of chaos on earth imagine from the beginning this happened so Cain was worried about looks and he says I'm not going to marry her now as the turbulence continued they went to their father the father heard about it he was upset he tried to explain to them and he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah showed him a way out what was the way out Allah says instruct the two of them one was a shepherd and one was a farmer who had produce instruct the two of them to give out a charity instruct the two of them to give out a charity and whoever's charity is accepted will be correct now what happened this is made mention of the Quran in the Quran Allah says وَتْلُ عَلَيْهِمْ نَبَا أَبْنَيْ آدَمَ بِالْحَقِّ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recite to them the story of the two sons of Adam with truth إِذْ قَرَّبَا قُرْبَانًا فَتُقُبِّلَ مِنْ أَحَدِهِمَا وَلَمْ يُتَقَبَّلْ مِنَ الْآخَرِ when both of them gave their sacrifices and it was accepted from one and it was not accepted from the other the question is why was it not accepted it is very interesting we are going to draw a lesson from this the one who was a shepherd was Abel he came with a good animal and he put it on the mountain why did they have to put it on the mountain there were no poor people at the time there's no poor to give the charity to so the plan at that time what used to happen is they used to put the sacrifice on the mountain and then they would go away when they come back they would see the fire has eaten one or the other when the fire has eaten your sacrifice it means it was accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if the fire has not eaten it it's not accepted it's rejected so this man came with a very good animal and put it there and the other brother Cain the one who was fighting and arguing he was a farmer he had produce he brought not mediocre produce but that produce that was now almost rotten and he put it there and he says right this is the sacrifice and they went away so one was accepted one wasn't it's very simple to know which one was accepted and why remember when we give out our zakah zakah is not a voluntary charity voluntary charity you can give what you want 
but at least try to give something which is reasonable. So for a voluntary charity, you can give second-hand clothes, you can give a little bit of leftover food and so on. No problem, because it is going to be made use of by someone underprivileged. That is a voluntary charity. But when it comes to zakah, don't do that. You need to give that which is good. We are not saying the best. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa tells Mu'adh ibn Jabal, ittaqi karaima amwalihim. That ya Mu'adh, when you go to collect the zakat from the people, don't take the best, but don't take the worst either. Take that which is mediocre, the middle. So when we are giving, let's not give the stock that is expired and say that's my zakat, I'm going to deduct it from my zakat. How? It's expired. You rather give it as a voluntary charity. Give that which is good, Allah will accept it. You'll see the difference of it in your life. But when we've given the poor wealth, sometimes, you know, we take a look at the two and a half percent, a small percentage is zakah. Other churches, they are giving 10% of the salary. Go and find out. Ask people who are following other churches. Happily, they come and say, no, this is 12%, 10 and another two from me. And with us, it's only two and a half percent. And you find a man scrounging saying, you know what? Are you sure I've got to give zakat on this? You know, do I really have to? May Allah open our doors. It is from Allah. And wallahi, a charity has never decreased anybody's wealth. That is a hadith. Charity cannot decrease your wealth. How much are you going to use? How much are you going to spend? So when one charity was accepted, the other one wasn't. Listen to the verse. He looked at his brother and says, I'm going to kill you. Now, why do you want to kill him when his was accepted and mine wasn't? Allahu Akbar. Now I want to kill him. For what? Again, this is shaitan's plan. Don't look at the root of the cause or the root cause. But go and just blame someone and lay the blame on him and start becoming violent. That's shaitan. So instead of looking at why it was rejected, he decided, right, I'm envious of this man. Firstly, he's good looking. Secondly, he's going to get a wife who's very good looking. Thirdly, his wealth is accepted. And he's a, he's a nice farmer. He's got all this, you know, uh, livestock and he's so happily living and so on. Why is it that I am not? He became envious of his own brother. Does this not happen in some homes? May Allah safeguard us. Where because of how good looking someone is, the others ignore them. Or sometimes the other way around, some parents ignore. And wallahi, we need to go home. Look, I'm not going to mince my words. We need to go home and ask ourselves, are we guilty of this? Without knowing, subconsciously, I always believe people are good. Shaitan is bad. Do you know, sometimes shaitan makes a parent ignore a child and give more importance to the one who's better looking without realizing wallahi sometimes shaitan makes a parent give more importance to the child who's more intelligent wallahi and this is shaitan's plan and the other child cannot talk they are depressed they cannot open up to anyone i have had so many emails from people who have this problem and they can't make mention of anything. And I say, should I talk to your parent? They say, no ways. But they feel so inferior. For what? Why should we do this? I would like to believe shaitan is bad. People are good. We need to try and make sure we don't fall into the trap of shaitan. So let shaitan not do the same thing that he did with the children of Adam. Where because of beauty, there was big chaos and disaster. Either way, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. So we are talking here, both sides of the coin. So he says, the brother gave an answer. Allah is going to accept the charity of the person who is conscious of Allah. Allah will accept the charity of the one who is conscious of Allah. If you are going to stretch your hand to kill me, I am not going to stretch my hand to fight you or to kill you back or to do anything to you because I fear Allah. I fear our creator who has created entire creation and he is the Lord of the worlds. This was the answer of the brother. But what happened? This brother was adamant. And shaitan had taught him how to kill. Imagine. How would someone have known how to kill? You've got to stop this person from breathing. How? Shaitan taught him how to murder. So he hit his brother with something very hard. Either a rock or something very hard. And he killed him. Allahu Akbar. He killed his brother. 
as soon as he killed his brother, he sat there looking at his brother. And he started regretting. He started regretting. Why did he start regretting? That is shaitan. As soon as you do something bad and you've executed it, he goes away. When a person commits adultery, it's made so beautiful. The run up to adultery is so beautiful. If he has iman or she has iman, as soon as it's committed, there is a guilt in the heart. Straight. Because now shaitan is gone. You feel. This is why one narration says, إِذَا سَرَّتْكَ حَسَنَتُكَ وَسَاءَتْكَ سَيِّئَتُكَ فَأَنْتَ مُؤْمِنٍ A sign that you are a mu'min is when your good deed makes you happy and your sin makes you regret. That's a sign you're a mu'min. But then there are people who will commit adultery after adultery and they will continue and go on and on. There are some on drugs. The first two times, two, three times, they regret. After that, no regret. After that, they do it openly. One brother was telling me that when they went to the World Cup, only Allah knows. He says, I seen so many people offering me weed. And when, they, when I said, no, I don't do this. They said, what? You're probably the only one. I said, no, it can't be. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. If it's that common, then may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from shaitan. And I'd like to believe that the brother was telling a lie. Because by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are not like that. We ask Allah to open our doors. Once the brother was killed, he looks at his brother. And now he went away. He went to Adam alayhi salam. And he carried on with the day. And Adam alayhi salam asks him, where's your brother? He says, my brother, I'm not responsible for him. Ah, why do I have to know where he is and what's happening? Immediately Adam alayhi salam knew that there's something wrong. This child is hiding something from me. There is something wrong. Now, later on in the evening, he went back to the body and he's looking at it. And the following morning, he's looking at this body again. And now it started releasing a stench. It started releasing a stench. And he was remorseful because of his regret. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had mercy on him. By sending him a lesson through two crows, Allah says in the Quran, فَبَعَثَ اللَّهُ غُرَابًا يَبَحَثُ فِي الْأَرْضِ لِيُرِيَهُ كَيْفَ يُوَارِي سَوْءَةَ أَخِيهِ قَالَ يَا وَيْلَتَا أَعْجَزْتُ أَنْ أَكُونَ مِثْلَ هَذَا الْغُرَابِ فأواري سَوْءَةَ أَخِي فَأَصْبَحَ مِنَ النَّادِمِينَ He regretted when he saw these crows come and the one was digging in order to bury the other and it dug and put the other into the ground and covered it. So he says, can't I be like this crow? Let me do this. So he dug a hole also and he buried his brother and so on. And he was very, very remorseful. And thereafter it is reported that he could not really stay with Adam alayhi salatu was salam and them with all the regret that he had. And so he went away. He went quite far. In fact, one narration says he carried the body on his back and he went quite far and then he buried it at a bit of a distance. Now he had gone. And thereafter what happened? Adam alayhi salatu was salam and his wife Hawa alayhi salam, they had many children. And as I said, they had 40 children, 20 pairs. And the pair were not allowed to intermarry. But those who were from a different pair were allowed to marry the others from another pair and so on. And he saw some of his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren and his progeny and his offspring. And it is reported that he'd seen thousands of them, thousands of his children. And they had gone various parts of the globe and so many different places they had gone to. And Adam alayhi salam used to constantly remind them and he used to tell them. And some of his children continued that reminder. One of them was a child known as Sheath. Sheath alayhi salam, we call him alayhi salam. He was also a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that he carried the message of his father. One narration says that there were 104 psalms that were revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These parchments that were revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from them 50 were revealed to sheath alayhi salatu was salam so he was also given guidance and he was told to guide the people and as time passed it became more difficult because they were further away from Adam alayhi salam it's like for example when your father has suffered to make his money 
and you were there watching him suffer and watching him go through turbulence and turmoil, it is easier for you to appreciate that. But when your children come and they've only seen wealth, for them to appreciate it is very difficult. And this is why wealth generally, it's not an Islamic law, but people who have, Muslims who have studied, have said it does not last for more than three generations without actually depleting totally. Three to four generations after that, it has to deplete because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a plan. And his plan is such that wealth does not stay in the same hands for long. It will move and it will, can, it will go on and on. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and contentment. So Adam alayhi salatu was salam, mashallah. He'd seen so many of his children and he was grooming his children also to continue the message. He used to call them regularly and tell them that this is what you need to do and that is what you need to do and so on. And this is how shaitan, they used to gather together and he used to remind them how shaitan led him astray and how shaitan was very jealous and so on. So there is something for us to learn from this as well. We need to gather our children and we need to constantly remind them not only of our beginnings but of the messenger of the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many of us have sat with our children and told them, do you know, this is what Allah requires. This is how we should be dressing. This is the benefit of this. This is the benefit of that. This is the downfall that one will taste if they do this and if they do that. And look at this example and that example. Spend the time with your children. It is the sunnah of the prophets. All the prophets, may Allah's peace be upon them. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of something very interesting again, where Adam alayhi salatu was salam got sick. He got ill. He got ill at a certain stage. And look at Allah's plan. Allah made him wish for something. Wish for what? Certain fruits he had eaten in Jannah. He ate some fruits in paradise. He still remembered the taste. So he was wishing for it, making dua to Allah, saying, Ya Allah, I'm wishing for these fruits. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed him that at a certain place, you will find something. Not that you will find the fruits. But at a certain place, you will find something. But he was unhealthy. He was not healthy enough to go there. So he decided to send some of his children. He says, go to that place and you will find something for me there. So when they went there, they found some angels. A group of angels. What did they have with them? They were dressed in white and they had some tools with them. There was a pick and a shovel and tools to dig. Now these tools were new to the children of Adam alayhi salatu was salam. They looked. These angels told the children of Adam, we are angels and we want you to go back to your father. He is ill and his time is up. Allahu Akbar. He is ill and his time is up. So they walked with, Adam, with the children of Adam alayhi salam back to Adam alayhi salam and as they entered, as they entered, Hawa, may peace be upon her, she recognized this angel is the angel of death. The angel of death. So she quickly started going behind Adam alayhi salatu was salam and he says, no, no, no. Don't worry, move away. I was created before you. I was created before you. He's going to go. He was not worried. Now why am I going and so on? He was reminded. In fact, he told the angel of death when he saw him, he says, but don't I have 40 more years to go? We made mention of this a few days ago. The angel says, don't you remember you gave it to Dawood alayhi salam? And he says, no, I don't remember. I don't remember. And after he was reminded, he says, no problem. However, he first gathered his children. Look at this. He gathered his children on his deathbed. And he reminded them saying, Allah will send messengers to you. He will not leave you alone. He will send messengers to you and messages. These messengers will come. Different languages, different names, different dialects. But their message will all be one. Calling you to worship one Allah, the one who made you. And to stay away from the devil and shaitan and iblis. And to be careful that the biggest crime anyone can commit is to associate a partner with the creator. And after he reminded his children, the angels took his soul away and he passed away. And he passed away happily. He was happy to go. Why was he happy to go? Very interesting. I think that's a lesson. When I was reading about it, really it brought tears to my eyes. 
he was happy to go because he knew he is going back to that heaven that he came from he knew he's going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he was happy to go because he had problems here on the earth he had tests he had difficulties he first hunted for his wife then he had the problems with his children and so on and now he had to taste death but that death was getting him to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from this there is a narration Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us through the lips of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tuhfatul mu'minil mawtu the gift of a true believer is death why you're going back to your maker your creator there's no more inflation there's no more robberies there's no more power cuts there's no more you know credit and debt and people following you and running behind you and sickness and cough and what have you everything ends it stops there is only justice and goodness and for you is what you wish and what you want and what you whatever you desire I always give the example of a child who works hard at school you work very hard at school for what in order to get a prize so now how are you going to get the prize if you don't want to attend the prize giving Allahu Akbar you got to go there and then you will shake the hand and get your prize if you don't go there how are you going to get your prize so for us we've been promised read salah you get this give you a zakah you do this dress appropriately this will happen for you do that this will happen where are we going to get all these prizes you need to go to the stage where is the stage you need to die first and then you get to the stage Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar simple to understand but still when we die or someone dies we become depressed and we start mourning to the degree that we question what Allah's decree was how can we do that it is natural to miss someone it is natural to shed tears of mercy because you're going to miss them but we never question the decree of Allah whatever Allah does is the best it is the best when Allah has taken a person away whether it is in a car crash or after sickness or suddenly or whatever it is it is the best that Allah could have done for that particular person we need to know this especially as mu'mineen as believers so we should not depress ourselves if they have gone we are going very very soon so Adam alayhi salatu wasalam went when he went what happened the angels had come with the tools they took the children of Adam alayhi salatu wasalam a little bit of a distance and they dug a, a, a proper grave and they washed the body of Adam alayhi salam with water they enshrouded him properly and they led the salah or the prayer the janazah of Adam alayhi salatu wasalam one narration says that Jibreel instructed sheath to lead the salah and another narration says the angels themselves led that salah only Allah knows but the salah was done and he was buried and once he was buried the angels looked at the children of Adam alayhi salatu wasalam and says hadihi sunnatukum this is the way you shall do it when anyone from amongst you passes away so that is how we were taught to enshroud and to leave a gap I was speaking to someone a few moments ago in fact a few days before Ramadan and we were talking about how amazing it is that the grave of a Muslim you have a gap you have a you are enshrouded in a shroud and then you are placed in the grave and the wooden pieces or the bricks are not put on you but there is a gap and then quite a big gap and then there is the wooden pieces and on top of that is the soil subhanallah do you know one of the benefits of that is it allows for the decomposure of that body in the soil because of the presence of oxygen in that hollow if there was no oxygen what happens let me tell you what happens look at the mass graves in the globe when the people are buried and the, the sand is straight onto them what happens you find the bone even after a thousand years you might find some of it has not yet decomposed because the, it is all there still the skulls are there everything is there whereas if you bury Islamically the proper way by leaving that gap who knew that there would be oxygen trapped in there which is needed for that to decompose Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar so now that it decomposes completely you dig it back up nine months later there is nothing remaining there illa ajb al -dhanab. the hadith speaks about the last small little portion at the bottom of your spine the conical the little cone shaped bone part of it remains and that is the seed of man from which you we will grow as i made mention of the other day 
So this is how we are to be buried. Where were we taught from? We were taught by the angels from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amazing story. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us a deep understanding. The question, where was he buried? It's a question. Some narrations say he was buried fil hind, close to where he had descended. Whereas other narrations say that he was buried in Mecca by the mount known as Jabalu Abi Qubais. Just outside where the Haram is now, he was buried somewhere there. But Allah knows best. All we know is he was definitely buried. And I had spoken about Sheath alayhi salam being another Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Insha'Allah, we will get to more of the stories of these messengers. The last question I have is, how many messengers were there? How many messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We don't know the exact figure. In the Quran, 25 are mentioned. In the Quran, there are 25 names of the messengers. But... Some narration of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam makes mention of different figures, the largest of which is 124,000. Imagine, 124,000 messengers. We don't know really whether that figure is correct, but we have a rough idea that there are so many, the Quran says, منهم من قصصنا عليك ومنهم من لم نقصص عليك There are messengers, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whom we have told you about and we've related to you their stories. And some whom we have not even told you about, which means there are so many, only Allah knows the exact number. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson until we continue again, inshaAllah, tomorrow we say, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad, subhanallahi bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa mutu'ala.